Well, sir, the year was 19 and 12. We've been working on a new railroad line going up to Knoxville City, Illinois. And, of course, other parts west. Old Burke, he was a-going up to what we call the Head's Inn. That is where the new track is being laid. Burke was going up to join our work crew up there. So off he went, in about high noon, I specs. So Burke gets on his hand cart and starts a pumping. Old Burke had to travel, oh, I'd say about ten miles to get to Head's Inn. Now, he knew that a slow freight train was about to leave going west also. However, it was going to stop at Bell's Crossing. That is about a mile short of Head's End, where Bert was going. Bert also knew the freight was leaving around, oh, I'd say about 1.22 p.m. in the afternoon. The only thing you ought to know is that old Bert was a strong six-foot-seven figure of a man with a great God-given good strength. So off he went. Now you gotta know a train engineer named Smokin' Joe was about to leave, and he was just leaving a tad bit early, driving that freight train. You see, he was going on a hot date that night with his girlfriend, Sharp. Smokin' Joe got into the cab of old number 1218, and started off down the tracks to Bell's Crossing. Meanwhile, Bert just took his time of pumping that old hand cart of his. You know, enjoying the view and such. Of course, Bert was smart as he well as he was strong. He knew enough to save the strength for those hills and valleys that lay ahead yonder. After all, there was also work to be done at the head end when he got there. Another interesting aspect of this here story is Sharp. You know, smoking Joe's gal. That's right, the internal tangle of love and such. It seems that old Bert, well, was sort of sniffing around young Charlotte and looking for her affections and such. He's becoming quite successful, too, in his young efforts. And, of course, baby Charlotte was enjoying all of this attention. Now the word must have got back to, guess who? That's right, Smoking Joe. And old Joe was none too happy about it. Some of the crew summarized that Smoking Joe knew that Bert had left for the heads in at around noon. Thus the reason for old Smoke and Joe leaving a tad that early for Bell's Crossing. All the crew did know for sure was that old number 1218 was heaving with heavy steam when she left the siding going on to the main track, not to mention the loud and long cry of her whistle. Now the track was certainly new all right, but since there were hills and valleys and such, you just gotta know that you gotta take it a tad easy in those turns and such. Therefore, about four miles down the track, old Smoke and Joe spotted Bert. Well, you just gotta know that Bert had no concern whatsoever with the train coming up from behind him. Since, after all, Joe was a good railroad engineer, and one of the best you could say. Surely old Joe would spot him and would take it easy the rest of the way to Bell's Crossing. Bert, it seemed, didn't even get a little concerned about the old steam whistle at number 1218 just a bellering away. And according to a farmer at that point down the track said, Bert never showed any concern whatsoever. The reason being, he said, was that Bert just must have figured that sort of the, the whistle got stuck. <laughs> you know, one of them things. You can only guess what it must have been like when old Bert found out that old smoking Joe was mad at him. According to various witnesses along the track, they said Bert started to pump in that hand cart all for his money. Old Bert was just a pump in that hand cart like hell wouldn't have it again, they said. Bert loose ground as he went at Bradshaw's Hill and gained some speed and distance coming down the other side. Of course, you had to know Bert had to break down those curves and such, but so did Smoking Joe. The witness said that old number 1218 was just a steaming as hard as he ever seen her. Her whistle's just a blowing and a blowing. Some said they could see old Joe's face, just all grimaced up and angry as hell, with one hand on the throttle keeping it wide open, and the other just a blowing that damn whistle. So there it went, mile after mile. Old Bert's strength was beginning to go, according to the people at Chi Town Creek. The smoke of Joe had just a gain in speed and ground, and Joe not even fearing the sharpest to curves. Why, they said that old engine number 1218 made the ground rattle and shake like an earthquake. 
Bert plumped down, drag out, swinging into the water reservoir, and over Shippen's Dam. After all, Bert could probably see the shadow of old number 1218 bearing down on him like an old black panther ready to strike. It must have been like living in hell, according to one excited observer. Well, Bert rounded Dead Man's curve, and up shot his hopefully looking for the downgrade, just past Hooter's corners in order to gain some speed and ground. They said that Bert was heaving heavy with exhaustion, and sweat was jucked out far down his face, and the veins on his neck stuck out like wild blue rivers of fear. Now you must know that as it was said, Bert was just as smart as he was strong. Otherwise, why did he not just jump off that damn hand cart go up a hill in the first place? Well, many a fella sort of figured out that he must have had a plan. Since he must have been pretty pissed off about the whole situation he found himself in. Surely he must have figured out that old Smokey Joe disliking him because of his show of affection for young Charlotte. Now as the two of them rounded the last curve at Bell's Crossing, it would seem to most people that since Joe stopped was at Bell's Crossing, the whole horrible situation would just come to an end. Since the track would just run out at head's end, and don't you know, no engine can keep on going without tracks, and no hand cart either. Not so. Old Smokey Joe just a kept it a coming, and old Bert just a kept it a pumping. To make the matter even more of a worst horrible situation, was that a work crew of six was just a waiting on a crew cart to get pulled up to head's end. There they were, just a sitting waiting for an engine. All the witnesses said they could see old Bert pumping that old hand cart down the straightaway, and they saw right up close behind him was old Smoking Joe driving old number 1218 wide open. Now, if you thought this was such a horrible affair, at this point, the next event was even worse. While old Bert just crashed that hand cart of his into the crew of six just a sitting there on their butts, on that their crew cart. And guess who was right behind them? Oh, Smokin' Joe himself, in number 1218. The shrill, loud whistle of the engine could be heard just a blurring in their ears, and the loud noise of the steam that was just a blasting out of 1218 cylinder ports. This was, of course, enough to make any God-fearing man even more fearing, so much so that hell wouldn't have it again. What a consumption this must have been. Folly as they rounded the outgoing curve of Bell's Crossing, old number 1218 was a pushing that old hand cart of Bert down the track like a male moose in heat, and Bert was just a pumping that hand cart like Satan himself was on his tail. Whatever Bert's plan was, nobody knows. Why he just didn't jump off that damned old cart in the first place, no one knows. The crew of six jumped off their cart like rats desert to sink the ship. That was the last anyone at Bell's Crossing saw. The horrible sight of Smokin' Joe shoving his engine down the track with Bert's handcart being pushed to God knows where. All that the people at the El Cross said is that a loud forward-over whistle was heard off in the distance, and a loud crashing noise. The crew at Head's End was all out for dinner at the time in the mess tent. All that was ever discovered or recovered was a twisted wreckage of old number 1218's engine and all the freight cars plus the caboose. And finally, one severely crushed hand cart. The work crew and the local authorities looked high and low for old Smokin' Joe, as well as old Burke. But nothing ever come of it. No one knows to this day where they are. Some said they just were crushed in too many pieces to be found. Others said they just left. That's not to get into big trouble with the railroad for causing such a horrible, expensive mess. But what we do know for sure is that young Charlotte disappeared two weeks later after the whole affair. It was said by some that Charlotte later moved away to parts unknown. However, it was also said by some that she had a big smile on her face when she left for Bell's Crossing on the old ball by a cannonball special that was headed for Tennessee. So there it is, one big mysterious mystery. It sort of makes you wonder what was really going on betwixt them all. So every time the people at Bell's Crossing hears a forlorn train whistle off in the distance, this brings to mind the whole horrid affair. And that's the way it was. Wide 
Pacific shore From the queen of flowing mountains To the south bells by the shore She's mighty tall and handsome And known quite well by all She's the combination of The Wabash Cannonball She came down from Birmingham One cold December day As she rolled into the station You could hear all the people say There's a girl from Tennessee She's long and she's tall She came down from Birmingham On the Wabash Cannonball You see, the Wabash Cannonball Brought my Charlotte Tommy Our eastern states are dandy, so the people always say From New York to St. Louis and Chicago, by the way From the hills of Minnesota where the rippling waters fall No changes can be taken on the Wabash Cannonball She glides along the woodland Through the hills and by the shore Hear the mighty rush of the engine Hear that lonesome hobo squall You're traveling through the jungles On the Wabash Cannonball 